Hello everybody, my name is Roisin Meany and I am delighted to be talking with you this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're listening to me. Um, usually I'd be in your classroom, of course, and I love going into schools. It gets me out of my um, kitchen, which is where I write my books, but unfortunately that can't happen at the moment. So we're doing the next best thing um, and we'll, uh, we'll do the best we can. This is kind of new to me. And I'm sure it's probably new to you as well, but uh, you know, you have to manage with what you have. So let's just begin. I'm going to just speak a little bit about writing, how I get into it, and how I go about writing a book. And, um, and then I read a little bit from one of the books I've written for your age group. I've written one and a half books for 10 to 13 year olds is the age group. Um, but of course, somebody a little bit younger or a little bit older can also read them and hopefully enjoy them. Why am I saying one and a half books? Well, let me show you. This is one of the books, and this is the other book. And as you can see, there are clearly two books. Why do I say one and a half? Okay, have a look at this cover. The hint is on the cover. Have you seen it? Look again. Yes, I co-wrote this book, See If I Care, with my friend Judy Curtin. You might know Judy because she's written loads of books for children, loads, or for young people. Um, and she asked me once if I'd like to try writing a book with her. And I said I would, because I've never done it before and I love trying new things. And we, um, it worked out really well, actually. Um, we were very happy with how it turned out. I'll speak a little bit more about that book towards the end of this session, because I'm going to read a little bit from it for you. And the other book, don't even think about it, is one I wrote by myself. This was written a year before, See If I Care, and it's a girl's diary. It's more suitable for fifth and sixth class. So if you're in fourth, maybe just hang on a little while before you jump into it. Um, the, the, the main character is a girl called Liz, and she lives with her dad. Her parents are separated, and she lives with her dad. And basically the book is her diary, and that is why I chose the title, Don't Even Think About It, because it's kind of what you say, isn't it, if anybody goes near your diary? Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed writing this book, actually. Um, it was the first children's book I ever tried, because mostly I write for adults. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. But Liz is uh, 13 at the start, 12 at the start of the book, and it ends on her 14th birthday. So it spans a year and a bit. She's 12 and a half at the start. Um, and of course, I was a lot older than 12 and a half, so how did I go about getting into the head of a girl that age? because to write her diary, I had to get into her head. So I had to, uh, to speak to lots of girls that age. And uh, luckily I had a niece, Freed, who was just the right age at that time, and she helped me a lot. And I also spoke to the fifth and sixth class girls in the school where I was teaching, because I used to be a teacher. I was still teaching at that stage. I was half writing and half teaching. Now I'm writing all the time. And that's one of the reasons I love going into schools. It just gives me a break from the writing. Um, what do you have to do to be a writer? I wonder if any of you are wondering that now, if any of you are thinking you might like the life of a writer. Well, simply put, I think what you have to do is read, you have to be a reader, and write. And that's really all you need, read and write. Um, I think by reading a lot, you learn a lot about how books are written. Even if you don't realise it, you're reading a story, you're not trying to learn anything really about books, but I think it goes in when you read. The more you read, the more you understand how a story works, how characters work, how a writer develops a story, starts at the beginning, grows it into a middle bit, and then brings it to a conclusion at the end. Um, I was a great reader. When I was very young, I read Nadi. They were my first books. I loved the Nadi books. I wanted to live in Toytan with Nadi and all his friends. And then I read all the other Rena Blyton books when I got a bit older, and then I read anything I could get my hands on, basically. I was always a reader. But I didn't start writing until I was um, over 40, would you believe? And I'm a lot older than that now. We won't go any further there. But I've written 18 books for adults to date, and I'm writing the 19th at the moment. And it's hard. It's hard. Writing a book is very hard. But, so you really have to love it to do it. And luckily, I do love it. 
And like I said, I was teaching and writing for a while. I was, I was job sharing in the classroom, so I was teaching one week, and then I had the next week off to write. But I found that I, I wasn't really happy with the two jobs. I found it too much for my head. So I had to make a choice, and I decided to be a writer. And my parents were a little bit worried at the time because being a teacher is very safe. And you know, you have your job and you get paid every two weeks and everything is fine and you get your nice summer holidays and Christmas holidays. And being a writer is very different. Being a writer has no safety going with it. You really are only as good as the books that you write. And if you write a book that, you know, people don't really buy and don't really like and um, it doesn't go well, then your publisher, whoever has published your book, might say, well, we don't really want any more books from you, sorry. Luckily, I'm touching wood, that hasn't happened yet, so I'm hoping. And I told you about the one and a half children's books that I've also read, so I'm going to be talking about um, them a little bit later. So how do you go about writing a book? Well, first of all, you have to start with an idea. And where do ideas come from? Answer, everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. I might hear something and I might think, oh, that sounds interesting. Somebody might tell me something or somebody might, um, somebody might be passing on something that they heard from somebody else. Or I might read something in a newspaper. Because the newspaper, when you think about it, the newspaper is full of stories. It's stories of things that have happened to other people. News is stories. And you never know what you can read that might just click in your head. And you might think, oh, that could make a good story. And then, of course, you have to take whatever idea you get and you have to turn it into your story and change it and put characters into your story and just grow your book out of that. Now, I have a secret weapon. When I'm out and about, don't worry, I'm not going to pull a gun out of my bag. This is my secret weapon. Doesn't look very dangerous. This is a notebook, just a tiny little notebook. And what I do is I have it in my pocket all the time when I'm going out and about. Even if I'm just going for a walk and I'm not bringing any bag, I'm not bringing any luggage with me, I slip this into a pocket along with a pencil or a barrow or something in case I hear something that I think I might like to use and in case I forget it before I get home. So as soon as I get home, if I have something written in the notebook, it goes straight into my computer. And I have a file on my computer called Ideas for Future Books. And that's where I go when it's time to start a new book. And I look through all the things I've written down in there. And hopefully, something will come up. Other times you can get an idea from, maybe if you go someplace. For example, when I was, I had given up teaching and I was writing full time. The school where I was teaching were having a special celebration because they were 25 years a school. And they were having a special 25th reunion of all their old, all the children that had been in the school, the parents of the children, and all the teachers that had taught there. So I got my invitation. And normally I don't like reunions. I, well, it's not that I don't like them, but I forget people very easily. I forget names of people, and sometimes I even forget faces too. So I, I would be very embarrassed going to a reunion normally. And I'd have to keep saying, oh, I'm really sorry, but remind me what your name is. And I didn't want to do that. But for this particular reunion, I decided I'd go. And I would, um, because I thought it wasn't that long since I had given up teaching. And obviously, I'd remember all the old teachers that I had taught with. And I hoped that I'd remember enough of the other people who would turn up. Now, I didn't remember a lot of the children, because at the time, I was teaching infants a lot of the time, when I was a teacher. I loved infants. And of course, they all had grown up since then. And I'm quite short. I'm only about five foot one and a half or something. So the teenagers, which they were now mostly, were towering above me. And I didn't recognize any of them. And I had to ask them, who are you? So I went along, though, to the reunion. And I had a great night. And I was talking with one of the mothers. I had taught her daughter in junior infants. And she said to me, wouldn't that make a good um, topic for a book, a reunion? And as soon as she said that, I thought, gosh, it actually would. Because you could start the book, I thought, at just before the reunion happens. Maybe, maybe it's somebody who was at school, at secondary school. And now, you know the way secondary schools have reunions. Maybe 10 years later, after everyone has left the school, they come back 10 years later. But this might be a 20-year reunion. 
So everyone has left school 20 years ago, and now they're getting invitations to come back. So if that was at the start of the story, and then you could have in the middle part of the book, in the biggest part of the book, you could have the 20 years in between and everything that happened, the characters that you're going to talk about. And then at the end, you could go back to the reunion again, or rather forwards to the reunion. So before I went home that night, I actually had a kind of a little plan for the next book in my head. And the book was written, I wrote it in the following year. And it was called, guess what? The Reunion. So ideas can just come from anywhere. And if you want to be a writer, you need to be open. And you need to be watching and listening. And sometimes I might be in a supermarket and I might overhear something, just by accident. I wouldn't do it deliberately. But I might overhear somebody having a little conversation with a, a neighbour or a friend or somebody they met in the aisle. And I might just catch something as I pass. And I might just think, oh, that sounds interesting. One time I was in Dublin, when I was walking down Dame Street, one of the main streets in Dublin, and I saw this couple coming towards me. And they were, I think, in their 20s, a young couple. And I kind of got interested as they got nearer to me, because I could see that they were having some kind of an argument. I could see from their faces and their gestures. You know, you, you kind of know when somebody is cross. So I walked slowly past them, and as I passed, the woman said to the man, every bone in my body hates you. At least, I think that's what I heard. I could be wrong, but that's what I heard. And I thought, oh, that's a terrible thing to say to somebody, but I also thought, kind of an interesting sentence. So I whipped out my notebook as soon as they were gone, and I wrote it down. I haven't used it yet, but I still have it. It's captured forever. And I think I will use it someday. I just think it's too good a sentence not to use. Every bone in my body hates you. And maybe it won't be a woman saying it to a man in the street like I heard. Maybe it'll be somebody maybe who goes into a bank and is looking for a loan. And maybe the manager is talking to that person and saying, well, I'm really sorry now, but I can't give you a loan because, and they you know, are talking away. And maybe it's just in the other person's head. Every bone in my body hates you. They might not say it aloud, but that's what they might be thinking. Maybe. Or it might be a little child looking for something to eat, and its mother or its father is saying, no, we're going to have dinner soon. You can't have that bar of chocolate. You can't have that packet of crisps. You can't have that biscuit. And maybe the child bursts out like little children do. Every bone in my body hates you. Maybe. So that's kind of where you start with the book. Some idea. Even just a, even just a phrase. Like you could grow something out of that. Or sometimes you might start with a character. You might decide, like one time this happened, I decided that I wanted a woman as my main character, because mostly women would be the main characters in my books. I'm talking about the adult books here now. And I, at the time, you see, I was trying to come up with an idea for a new book, and I decided that I would go somewhere different, just to get my brain a kind of a refresh, kind of click the refresh button in my brain, and to see if I could come up with something different for the ideas. Because maybe I read through the ideas for future books file, and maybe nothing jumped out at me, because sometimes that can happen too. So I went to this little island off the coast of Kerry. It's called Valencia. Some of you might know it. It's gorgeous. I went there in November. Now, Valencia is full of tourists in the summer. It's full of tourists. The whole island just doubles, or maybe even triples, in population, because so many people want to go there. It's a beautiful, beautiful summer island. In November, it was quite quiet, and a lot of the businesses were closed for the winter. So I got a different feel to the island, but I just loved it. And I decided I wanted to set my next story on it. And then I started thinking about a character. What character would be on this island? I didn't have any story yet. I just had the location, the island. So who, I thought, could I write about on that island? Somebody living there all the time. But I wanted it set in summer, because I wanted lots to be going on. I wanted the island to be busy and buzzing and lots of tourists and lots of things happening. So I thought, what if my main character decided that she wanted to let her house for a few weeks in the summer because she wanted to make money? And then I had to ask myself, why does she want to make money? And I answered myself by saying, maybe she's getting married 
and maybe she needs money for the wedding. Maybe they're not very well off herself and the man she's marrying. And they're both trying to get money together for the wedding. And this is what she thinks she can do. So she has her house and she decides to let it because, okay, I thought, if she lets her house, then she has to find somewhere else to live. I thought she could move back in with her parents because maybe they live on the island too. Or maybe she could move into some place if she has a business on the island. And then I thought, what if she was the hairdresser on the island? And maybe she has a little room upstairs in her salon that's not really being used. Maybe she just uses it as a little storeroom. And maybe she could live there just for a few weeks. Maybe she could put a bed in there and, you know, put a, get a little small fridge that would sit on a table or whatever. And maybe she could just live there for a few weeks and let the house. And then I thought I'd have other bits to write about because I'd have the people who come to stay in her house. And they could have their own stories. They could be bringing their own stories from wherever they're coming from. And that's actually what my next book turned into. And I called it One Summer. And it was set on the island. Now, I call the island a different name. I didn't call it Valencia, because I was just a little bit afraid that somebody would, maybe somebody living in Valencia might think, but she hasn't got the island right. She said there's a garage on the way into the village from the pier. But there isn't. The, the garage is on the other side of the island. And I just might have got things wrong that might annoy the people who lived there. So I thought, just to be on the safe side, I changed the name. And I made up a name. I called it Rune. And if you know you're Irish, you'll know that Rune is the Irish for secret. And I made the island a little bit kind of magical in a way. I made things happen on the island that people couldn't really explain. Like, for example, there was an apple tree on the island. And you know the way apple trees give apples once a year? This apple tree gave apples more than once, twice or three times. You'd pick the apples off it, and then a, few, a month later, you'd see more growing. And nobody could explain it. And another thing that happened was, if you were at the cemetery or the graveyard in the island, people always got a smell of oranges or chocolate. They got one or the other. Some people smelt oranges, some people smelt chocolate. And there was no reason for either of those smells to be there. So just funny things like that happened on the island. And that was, that was, the, that was what came out of me going to Valencia and just wandering around and thinking and, and, you know, following an idea and asking myself questions and answering the questions. So that's how a book grows. It's really that you have to just keep on thinking and turning things over in your head. And for the month or so that I would be thinking about a new book, I don't sleep very well. And it's not really surprising because my brain finds it hard to switch off at night time when I want to go to sleep, but my brain has other ideas. And it's still thinking, okay, but what if? And what if we did this? And what if that character did this? And maybe they could go here. And maybe this would happen. And yeah, impossible. But once I start writing a book, then it calms down a little bit. And the story grows. Now, I would always have a plan before I start a book. I would have a plan, roughly. I don't have a very detailed plan, because I don't like... I, I would feel then that I would be kind of hemmed in by it, and I wouldn't be able to let the story grow on its own, which sometimes does happen. Sometimes things happen that you haven't really anticipated. And sometimes I even think the characters are giving me a bit of the story, which is absolutely ridiculous, because they're all living in my own head. But it feels like that sometimes. And when I finish a book, and a book would take me maybe six or seven months to write the first draft, but when I finish that first draft, I, again, ridiculously, I miss the characters, because they're part of my head for those months. They're living in my head. They almost feel like I know them. I do know them. I've made them. I know everything about them. I know what makes them tick. I know what kind of people they are. Some of them aren't so nice. Some of them are nicer. Some of them are lovely. Some of them I really, really get fond of. And then maybe somebody dies in the book because maybe it just has to happen. And I get so sad if it's someone I really liked, which is crazy. I know it's crazy. Don't tell me I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. But that kind of happens. Um, so, yeah, roughly six to seven months for a first draft. After that, I send it to my editor, and she has a look at it. Oh, by the way, I should mention that a first draft for an adult book would normally be around 90,000 words. Now, that might sound like a heck of a lot of words, and it is. But usually when I'm writing a first draft, I try and do 20,000 in a month. So, 20,000 a month, if you do your maths, 
you should have the 90,000 in about four and a half months. Now, that's why it takes me a bit longer because it doesn't always work out that way. Some days I'm just not in the mood to write and nothing happens. Some days I write something and I think it's okay and I might read over it the next day and I think, oh, rubbish, and I scrub it all out. So when you're writing a book, especially a first draft, it goes one step forward, maybe two steps back, maybe two steps forward, maybe one step back, three steps forward, one back. It's always back and forth like that. It doesn't go in a straight line. In my experience, it doesn't go in a straight line. Other writers are different. Writers have all sorts of different ways to work. This is just the way I do it. So then my editor reads the first draft. She's, uh, she's been with me since book three. And now I was saying that I'm on book 19 now. So we've been together a long time. She's been my editor all that time. And she's very good. She's really a good editor. She can pick out bits that are a bit weak. And she makes her notes. And then she comes back to me, maybe a month later. And she says, Roshin, I think you should just have another look at these bits. And she gives me suggestions to improve those bits. Or maybe she'll think, well, that character needs to be a little bit different. And so I have another look at that character. And I change him or her if I think I should. You know. But usually, like I say, she's, she's right. She's a very good editor. So I usually go by what she says. So then I have to write a second draft based on my editor's changes. And that might take a month, maybe six weeks. And then after that, I send it to her again. And usually she's happy enough with that draft. But then it's not finished because now it has to go to a copy editor. Copy editor is a person who checks through everything really and decides that, that you know, um, you have a mistake there because you said this person's birthday is in February and they're not in the next chapter. They're in March. So I go, whoops, let's change that. And then it goes to proofreading, another person looks at it, and that's the last person to check it. And then they say, okay, it's all right now, we think. But guess what? A lot of books have mistakes in them, even after all those checks. Small mistakes, hopefully. But yeah, mistakes can get through. I'm going to, because we're nearly out of time, would you believe, I'm going to read a small little bit from C, if I care. This is the book I wrote with Judy. Um, it's about two pen friends, Luke and Elma. We deliberately put a boy in one, boy is one of the main characters, and a girl is the other, because uh, we wanted boys to read this too. I'm not sure if they did. Look at the cover. This is actually the Australian book, because I've lent my Irish book to one of my neighbours, and I haven't got it back, so I'm reading from the Australian. It's exactly the same book, though. I like that cover, but I don't think many boys would be interested. I'm going to read the first letter that Luke sends to his pen friend. Dear pen friend, see what you think of this, actually. Pretend you're getting this letter from your pen friend. My name is Luke Mitchell. I'm 11 years and 8 months old and 153 centimetres tall. And I have jet black hair with blue tips and my nose and left eyebrow are pierced. I have a tattoo of a unicorn on my shoulder and I'm a genius on the computer. My older sister is a model. I don't know why I'm smiling, by the way. My older sister is a model and is often on the cover of magazines. My father's an astronaut and is training to be the first Irish man in space. We live in a big house out the country, with a lake in the back garden, and we own three racehorses. Their names are Thunder, Rocket, and Diamond. Last year, Rocket won a race in Leopardstown, and we got 10,000 euro. My father bought me a new laptop computer. In my spare time, I like mountain climbing and whitewater rafting. I've climbed Karen Tumble, Ireland's highest mountain, three times. And last, year, last summer, I went whitewater rafting in Turkey. What are your hobbies? Must go now. I have tons of homework. Yours sincerely, Luke Mitchell. Hasn't he a wonderful life? And guess what? None of it is true. He's made it all up. I actually wrote Luke's story in the book, and Judy wrote Elma's story. Elma's the girl. And we didn't show one another what we were writing at all. So I didn't know anything about Elma's life except the letter that she wrote to Luke every time Judy came to the end of her chapter. We wrote every second chapter. So I wrote that letter and I thought, I wonder will Elma know that it's all lies? But you'll have to read the book and find out what you think Elma thought. Because I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to be mean like that. So I hope you enjoyed the session and I'm really sorry that it seems to have flown by. I hope you felt it flew by too. Um, and I hope you like reading books and I hope you keep reading. And I hope I'll be able to go back into classrooms soon because I really, really would like it. So um, yeah, every good wish.